Welcome. This video is going to talk about energy and its relationship with chemical reactions and specifically we're going to be looking at heat and its role in chemical reactions. So energy is usually more the domain of the physicist, but it is always involved in chemical reactions. So this is one of those times where we need to involve energy or physics with our work in chemistry. So the simplest definition of energy is simply the ability to do work or produce heat. And energy is said to exist in two basic forms. You can have potential energy, which is energy you're not using. So it's considered to be energy due to position like when you have you know, a little car wound up ready to go, or you're at the top of the ski hill ready to ski down. Or, more importantly to us, potential energy is also um, stored in the chemical bond, so it's, your chemical composition gives you a certain amount of potential energy. And we usually read this on our food packages by looking at how many calories are in it. What's the potential energy that that food will give you? Kinetic energy, on the other hand, is the energy of motion. So you're actually using or employing the energy. So this is when you're on the treadmill and it's telling you how many calories you've burned up. So chemical systems contain both potential and kinetic energy. There's always kinetic energy in a chemical system because remember the particles are always moving. That's part of the kinetic molecular theory. So there's always some random motion going on. Even in solids, um, when they're vibrating in place, there's still kinetic energy. But there's also potential energy from the way the particles are bonded together and depending upon what kind of bond it is, the potential energy will vary. So most of the energy we use in our bodies, I mean, you know, so things we physically do each day, comes from a chemical reaction involving respiration. So that's we bring in oxygen to combine with the food we eat. And then bonds are being broken to help release energy as that food gets broken down into simpler substances. Chemical potential energy is stored in a substance because of its composition and it's affected by the type of atom, the type of bond or bonds, the number of bonds, and the arrangement of atoms. So there's a lot of things that are going to affect the chemical potential energy of different foods. So when you talk about simple sugars or complex carbohydrates, you're talking about how much energy and how easily that energy is released. Much of all chemical potential energy ends up being released as heat. And heat has a funny abbreviation of Q. So why Q for heat? Well, because heat was really um, poorly understood when scientists were first working with this, and they just referred to it as quantity. So the quantity of heat being transferred. So heat is energy that's in the process of flowing from a warmer object to a cooler object. So when you, you know, put your hand or lay your face on something, if it feels warm to you, that's an indication to you that heat is flowing from that object to you. But if it feels cool to you, then you're losing heat to that object. Heat always flows from warmer to cooler. And that makes sense because the warmer object has faster moving particles, the cooler object has slower moving particles, so the faster moving particles are going to tend to speed up the slower moving particles. The amount of heat a substance has depends on the mass and the starting temperature of that substance. Remember, the temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy of the particles, and the mass is the measure of the number of particles. So heat is going to um, increase when you increase either the temperature or the mass for that substance. Common units for heat are calorie and joule. And in the United States, we tend to use calorie a lot, but the rest of the world tends to use joule. What's the difference? Joule is about four joules to one calorie. So it's just a matter of getting used to it, but they both are expressing the heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of pure water by one degree Celsius. All chemical reactions have a change in heat. They're either gonna gain heat or they're gonna lose heat. And this is because all chemical reactions involve three basic steps. First of all, the bonds in the reactants are broken, not broken, but just broken which requires energy. The bond breaking step always requires energy to pull them apart. So think about having something built out of your Legos. You tear them all apart, that requires energy. 
So then the atoms, once it's all apart, the atoms collide with each other, and if they collide in the right way, they may make some new stuff. Or if they don't collide in the right way, the old stuff reforms. If the old stuff reforms, that's not considered a chemical reaction, okay? Because it's going to take the same amount of energy to put it back together. Nothing new there. So what we're interested in is when it does form new stuff. When new stuff forms, that means new bonds are, are formed and new products are formed. This always gives off energy. This releases energy to put it back together, make it more stable. So endothermic reactions are reactions that are, absorb or gain more heat than they release. So more energy is put into breaking the bonds than is needed to make the bonds. So the container is going to feel cooler to us. We're going to see a decrease in temperature overall in that reaction. Exothermic reactions release or lose more heat than they gain. So during the bond making process, more heat is given off than what you had to put in at the front end to do the bond breaking. And then the container is going to feel warmer to us. Going back to our units of heat, calories are a really small amount. If you counted your food calories in what we think of as little c calories, there's a lot of them. When we talk about calories, we're really referring to big C calories or what's a kilocalorie. Now, a big C calorie, little c calorie, unless you see it written, it's hard to know which one you're talking about. If somebody just says the word calorie, you don't know if they're really talking about calories or kilocalories. So I tend to like the word kilocalorie, so then I'm clear that I'm talking about a thousand calories. Joules, kilojoules, again, joules are a fairly small unit of energy. Kilojoules would be a thousand joules. So here's the common conversion factors between joules and calories, kilojoules and kilocalories. So let me work a couple examples with this. A fruit and oatmeal bar contains 142 kilocalories. Convert this energy to calories. So I'm going to go ahead and write this down as kilocalories so I remember that it's 1,000 calories in there. And I'm going to set up my conversion factor, and I see that I want calories... I have kilocalories, and up here I can see that there's a thousand calories in a kilocalorie. So this is going to be 142,000 calories. An endothermic process absorbs 138 kilojoules. How many calories of heat is this? Well, if I look up here, I can't convert right from kilojoules to calories. But I can change my 138 kilojoules to joules. And when I look, I see there's 1,000 joules in a kilojoule. So this could be 138,000 joules. And now that I have joules, I can change joules to calories because I see that there's 0 0.2390 calories in a joule or 4.184 joules in a calorie. It doesn't matter which conversion factor I use. I'm going to use the 0 0.2390 since that'll put a 1 on the bottom of my ratio. And when I plug and chug here, I come up with a final answer of 32,982 calories. So here's a couple for you to try, so I encourage you to pause and see what you can do on these. So for the first one, I have 520,700 joules of energy. How many kilojoules is this? So I need kilojoules on top, joules on the bottom. So this one's pretty straightforward. I just divide by the thousand, which is going to give me 520. 0.7 kilojoules. If I wanted to go on and convert this to calories, now I have 520.7 kilojoules. And remember, big C calories is really a kilocalorie. So kilocalorie from kilojoule, I see that a kilocalorie...
is a thousand calories, a kilojoule is a thousand joules. So I actually can use this conversion factor right here because this would mean if I take calories times a thousand, I'd have kilocalories. If I take joules times a thousand, I'd have kilojoules. So I can assume one kilocalorie also has 4.184 kilojoules. Or again, I could have used the one above. This would also be true times a thousand. This would be true for kilojoules and kilocalories. So taking my 520.7, dividing by the 4.184, I get 124.5 kilocalories.